All right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, I know it's already late for, for many of you. So my name is Melissa Siegel. I work here at Maastricht University, but specifically the Maastricht Graduate School of Governance and the United Nations University Merit here. So we're really the public policy school of Maastricht University. And so one of the things I'm gonna talk about today is really kind of a public policy approach to migration. And I think migration is one of those things that many people think that they know something about, but there are a lot of myths out there and uh, um, a lot of facts that are not real facts um, that are floating around around um, migration, migration and development. And especially with the refugee crisis that we've seen also within Europe, which I would actually consider not specifically a refugee crisis, but a crisis of Europe and a humanitarian crisis, we have seen um, migration really pop up even more, especially on the European agenda. So what I want to do for just the next 30 minutes is to talk about a lot of the myths and then actual realities of migration. And I'm gonna start off by just giving you a brief overview of kind of the lay of the land on migration, and then we'll go through some of those myths and realities. Um, luckily, or not luckily, it's late, um, but we are the last program in this room, so if we do go a little bit over, that's okay. So I was told that I'm actually allowed um, to take some questions from the audience. We'll try to keep it brief, but I will open it up at the end for some questions. And we'll just let people come on in. Um, all right, so let's just get started directly. So why do people migrate? There are already a lot of common misconceptions here about around why people migrate. So if I were to ask you guys why, why do people migrate, people first say, well, for conflict or persecution reasons because they see what's going on right now with the refugee crisis. Or they say for economic reasons or to seek a better life. But there are a lot of other reasons why people migrate that we maybe don't directly think about, but are a big reason why people migrate. So one is just family migration, family reunification, family formation, student migration, and, and many other types of migration. So it's important for us to realize that migrants aren't all just in one box. I myself am a migrant here in the Netherlands. So I originally come from the United States, and I've been living in the Netherlands now for quite some time. But if I ask a normal Dutch person on the street who is a migrant, they will generally never say someone like myself. So just to give you a quick um, view of some of the numbers around migration. So current estimates show migrants at, a bit, at, at around 250 million people in the world. Now this is an underestimation because these are only the people who are registered in countries of destination and also only those people who stay for at least one year or longer. So this doesn't capture seasonal migration, temporary migration, and of course, undocumented or irregular migration. Now another important thing for us to know about, especially when we're considering development issues from migration, is the money that migrants send back to their families in their countries of origin. And we call those remittances, or financial remittances. And as you can see here, more than $350 billion are going back to developing countries just from migrants abroad. So you can imagine how important this money is for those who are receiving it back in their countries of origin. Now, forced migration is big right now on the agenda. It's something that I think you're seeing very regularly just in the media in Europe. So I think it's important for us to break down these figures. We've had, we have larger numbers now of uh, forced migrants in the world than any other time since World War II. This is made up of different types of forced migrants. So we have refugees that are now more than 20 million people in the world. But there's a difference between refugees and internally displaced persons and asylum seekers. So refugees are those people who have actually received status in a country of destination of being a refugee. When they just flee to another country before they receive this status, when they are looking for status, they are asylum seekers. And then the largest group of forced displacement is actually internally displaced persons. The difference between internally displaced persons and refugees is that refugees or asylum seekers have actually crossed an international border. Internally displaced persons have been displaced within their own country. So they're actually much more vulnerable than even refugees because it's often hard to get aid and assistance to those people who are displaced within a country. So you might even think about the situation right now in Syria. We know that there are quite a few what we call trapped 
populations in Syria right now. So people who have been maybe displaced internally and would like to get outside of Syria, but because of where the conflict is happening, it's too dangerous for them to cross certain areas of the country, so they're stuck. They're actually um, involuntarily immobile, and they're extremely, extremely vulnerable populations. So sometimes when we see these numbers in the millions, it's hard for us to really grasp what this means. And when the number gets too big, people kind of just often glaze over. So to put this into perspective a little bit more, right now, 24 people are being displaced every minute. So just think about how many people are being displaced during the talk that I'm giving right now. So, where do migrants come from? And when migrants leave a country of origin, we call them emigrants. And this is already now where we sometimes get some misconceptions. So in absolute terms, this shows you kind of the top 10 of where migrants are coming from in the world. You see the, the especially the top four that are always on this list, depending on the year, are India, Mexico, Russia, and China. But there might also be some countries on here that may be of surprise to you. So if you look at number 10 and number 11, we have the United Kingdom and Germany. Top the top, round out the top 10 and 11 countries in the world sending migrants abroad. I mean, if we look at also the political debate right now going on in the UK on, with migrants, definitely the UK only sees themselves as an immigrant country when they're actually very much so an emigrant country. So they are very much so sending their own people abroad to other countries around the world. So this is in absolute terms, but if we look at it in relative terms, these are the countries that top the list with regard to um, relative position. So this is really as a percentage of these countries' populations how many people are outside of the country. And you can see here, generally these are small island nations, small countries in general, that have large portions of their populations outside of the country. So while they don't top the list in absolute numbers, you can see that migration would actually affect these countries much, much more. I mean, just Jamaica here at the bottom of the list has 40% of its population outside of the country. And you have other other um, groups here that, you know, top 50, 60 percent of their populations currently outside of the country. So you can imagine how impactful migration is then for these countries. Okay, so that's where migrants were coming from. Um, but now, where do refugees come from? So I'm sure you all know they're currently coming from Syria. Syria now tops the list for a number of refugees, for source countries of refugees. They have overtaken Afghanistan, who held that position for the last three decades, but Afghanistan is still in second place. You can see Somalia, South Sudan, Sudan, um, and several other countries in Africa, M Myanmar, and also Colombia in Latin America. Now, where are immigrants coming from? So general migrants, which countries are they going to? So we saw where they're coming from, now where are they going to? So first and foremost, in absolute terms, the U.S. tops the list by far. Um, more migrants go to the United States than any other country in the world. However, if you would group all European countries together, Europe would be a little bit ahead of the United States with regard to current numbers of immigrants. Now, you might also already be wondering about some of the countries on this list. So again, from the media, you'd probably think that a lot of migrants go to the US, a lot of migrants come to Europe. But look at the country that's number two on this list, Saudi Arabia. And this is in absolute terms. And Saudi Arabia is not a very big or populous country. So uh, number two, Saudi Arabia, Germany. And then right next to Germany is also Russia, the Russian Federation. Russia receives lots of migrants, lots of labor migrants every year. And then also the United Arab Emirates, another very small country, again in absolute terms, really at the top of the list. So I think this already shows you that it's by no means all migrants just going to developed countries, just going to Europe or to North America. Now again, if we look at this in relative terms, so countries receiving migrants, as a percentage of their total populations, you can see that there are quite a few countries here that have more than 50% of their populations made up of immigrants. Now, to put this in perspective, most European countries have around 10% to maybe 15% you 
immigration in their countries. And there's a lot of discussion about this and concerns that maybe these numbers are too high. And here we have countries that have as much as 50%. If you look at Qatar and the United Arab Emirates, more around 90% of their populations are made up of immigrants. So I think that already um, shows you a very different picture of migration. Now, if we already go ahead and, and head into some of the myths of migration. So one of the myths regularly perpetuated is that migration is at an all-time high and it's accelerating fast. We are just going to be overcome by a wave of humanity from the rest of the world and we're seeing things we've never seen before. Now, with regard to refugees, as I said, we do see more refugees than we've seen since World War II. But still, refugees as a proportion of the rest of the world's migrants is actually quite a small number. So if we look at the figures, here you can see in absolute terms again, these are from UN population statistics. So again, these are based on migrants that we know that are documented in countries of destination and have stayed there for at least one year. And as you can see, since the 1960s, the absolute numbers of migrants have been increasing over time. But there are also other things that have been increasing over time. World population has also increased immensely over the last 50 years. So if we look at this actually as a percentage of the population, we can see that nothing's really different today as we've seen back in the 60s. So the number of, of worldwide migrants has always hovered around 3% of the world population. So again, this idea that things are completely out of whack now is just a, is really misunderstood. So another myth is that refugees are mainly hosted in developed countries. And I think if you would ask most Europeans on the street, they would think that most refugees are hosted in Europe. This is not even close to being true. So if we look at the top countries for, that are currently hosting refugees, we see that Turkey tops the list right now with an estimation of um, two and a half million refugees. And this was just at the end of 2015. And we know that those numbers have grown. And in many of these countries that already topped the list, we know that there are lots of undocumented forced migrants also in those countries. So you can see already in number two is Pakistan. Pakistan and Turkey have been hosting, well, no, Pakistan has been hosting many refugees for a long time. The same thing with Lebanon, and they're getting new flows also now. Iran, both Iran and Pakistan have been hosting large numbers of Afghans for decades, so more than a million refugees on both sides for decades. You can see Ethiopia, Jordan, Kenya, Uganda, DRC, Congo, and Chad. Now, these are probably the countries who can least afford to be hosting these kinds of populations. These are definitely not the richest countries in the world, and some of them are some of the poorest countries in the world, like Ethiopia, for instance. Also, many of these countries are not that large. If you look at Jordan, for instance, it's quite a small country hosting an absolute number of refugees that is quite large. So actually, if we look at this in, ab in relative terms, that was in absolute terms, in relative terms now as a percentage of the population in these countries, you can see that both Jordan and Lebanon are hosting way, way more migrant, way, way more refugees than any other country in the world. They're both quite small countries with populations of around five, six, seven million people in total, and they're hosting between around one million refugees currently. So you can imagine the burden on these countries. These are also resource poor countries, so they're not necessarily monetarily poor, but they're poor in resources like water. So if you add a million people to the population, the water scarcity gets even worse. And then you can see again here as a percentage of the population, Nauru, Chad, Djibouti, South Sudan, Turkey, Mauritania, and only Sweden and Malta in Europe top this list with regard to absolute population figures. And Sweden is a country who for many, many years has been um, taking in resettlement of refugees from around the world. So we, Sweden has been there for quite some time. So another myth around migration is that poverty is the main cause of South-North migration. And by this, you can think of migration from developing countries to developed countries. 
Well, again, if we just look at some data, I'm not sure how much you might know about these countries, but if we look across the board here, the countries that actually have the largest number of migrants abroad are the richest countries on this graph. So countries like Benin, Burkina Faso, Cameroon, Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana, Nigeria, Mali, they're the poorest countries on this list. And Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia are by far the countries that have the most resources on this list. And they're the ones who send the most migrants abroad. And we're going to come back in a moment to, to why that is. So another myth, and we hear this a lot in development cooperation, I work a lot with um, different governments, so the Dutch government, German government, Swiss government, and we hear regularly from development cooperation, well, that just if we develop these countries, people will stop migrating. That's a really problematic myth. So one thing here is we have to talk about whether or not migration causes development or whether development causes migration. And actually, it goes both ways. So here you can see that as a country develops, one, the first line that's very clear here is the immigration line. So that's receiving, oops, sorry, that's receiving migrants. So as a country develops, they will receive more and more immigrants from other countries because these destinations are very attractive, both for people coming from developing countries and from developed countries. But what's interesting here is as a country develops, Immigration in the very beginning is actually extremely low. When a country is very poor, very few people migrate from that country. And that's for multiple reasons. Then you can see there's a kind of tipping point at which migration starts to decrease. But migration never goes to zero. So if that were the case, no Americans like myself would be in the Netherlands, no Germans would be in the Netherlands, or anyone else, right? So we know that migration does not stop with development. What actually happens is that as a country develops, their people have more resources, more capital, more networks to actually be able to leave the country. And at the same time, their skills are much more demanded. So the countries who we might see here at the top of this curve are countries like we saw that topped the absolute numbers list. These are countries like Mexico, the Philippines, China, India. So these are countries that are maybe not fully developed, but they have a lot of skills that other countries are very interested in acquiring. So I think that's already one of the first myths to, to understand. And if we come here and just look at some data, so this is based on the Human Development Index of UNDP. Here you can see very clearly the trend that I was telling you about in red. I think it's red for you also. Um, immigrants, you can see, as a country goes from very low development to very high development, they receive more and more immigrants. But as far as migrants leaving the country, you can see at a very low development, there are very few people leaving the country. In that middle range of development, we see a lot of people leaving the country. And still at the very high end of development, we st still see much more emigration, so migrants leaving the country, than from the lower ends of human development. So I think it's already really important for us to realize that actually as a country develops, we're just going to see more migration. The big difference is that once a country develops enough, we generally stop caring that, that we're receiving migrants from those countries. The discourse changes. We stop talking about... Um, um, you know, people just seeking a better life and we start talking about expats and highly skilled migrants and a global race for talent. So it's not at all that these movements are changing, it's that our perceptions of those migrants in those countries are changing. So another myth is that most migration is from developing countries to developed countries. If you would just look at the news and the discussions in policy circles right now, you would think that all migration in the world is from developing countries to developed countries. Again, this is just absolutely not the case. So again here, if you read this figure as South being developing countries and North being developed countries, you can see that actually migration from developing countries to other developing countries is just as high as migration from developing countries to developed countries. And then almost 25% of world migration is also migration from developed countries to other developed countries. So Americans to the Netherlands, Germans to the Netherlands, Germans to the United States. 
but we have a whole different discourse around these movements than we do the other movements. And we basically don't talk out about south-south migration at all. And there's even north-south migration, so people migrating from developed countries to developing countries. Now, this is marginal, but it's still happening. And this are sometimes expats being posted in developing countries, but a lot of this is actually retirement migration. So people moving from developed countries around the world to places where their money goes further, the weather's nicer. Another myth is that migration policies have become more restrictive over time. Well, if we look at research coming out of Oxford University and the DMIG program, what they did here was actually map migration policies in OECD countries from 1900s till today. This took a long time. But what you actually see here is anything above line zero means that policies have become more restrictive. Anything below line zero means that they've become less restrictive. So what you can actually see is that over time, in general, policies have become less restrictive. But of course, we need to nuance this. There are lots of different types of migration policies. So if we break it down into different types of migration policies, so, so border and land control, entry and stay, integration, and exit. So you might not realize that actually in many countries around the world, there are restrictions on being able to exit them. And we've saw, seen this even more over time. So what you can also see here is that border control and land control have become more restrictive over time. Exit controls have fluctuated quite a bit to being quite restrictive in the early 1900s, early mid 1900s, and then went down quite a bit, and now we've seen a bit of an uptick in more recent years. But at the same time here, you can see that legal entry and stay and integration policies have become much less restrictive over time. So a final myth is that migration re restrictions will reduce migration. So this seems maybe counterintuitive that this would be a myth. But what we actually see is that often migration restrictions have a lot of unintended consequences and often do the opposite of what they're meant to do. So just as an example, since we're in the Netherlands, I'll use a Dutch case. So this is how the Dutch government stimulated unwanted migration from Suriname. So Suriname was a former Dutch colony. Um, in the 1970s, there was a whole discussion about the independence of Suriname. And one of the main reasons that Dutch parliamentarians wanted to give, um, uh, wanted to give independence to Suriname is because they wanted to stop migration from Suriname. So what happened though here was that at independence, the Surinamese were told that they could either choose for a Surinamese passport or a Dutch passport. So what this did was stimulate a lot of people who never planned to migrate to the Netherlands to migrate to the Netherlands in what we call now or never migration. So what happened was that many people thought never even considered moving to the Netherlands, but when it was told to them that there was gonna be a barrier and it was gonna be very hard to ever enter the Netherlands, they decided that, who, okay, uh, maybe I didn't want to migrate in the next five years or 10 years, but I don't want to never be able to go to the Netherlands. So now let's choose for a Dutch passport and leave Suriname about half of the population of Suriname left during this period and came to the Netherlands, doing the exact opposite of what the Dutch government was hoping. And you can see a huge spike then at independence, and then another spike when visas were introduced. So again, this happened. The parliament still said, okay, we've got to find a way to stop migration completely, imposed visa restrictions, and we had the second wave of now or never migration happening to the Netherlands. So again, exactly the opposite of the intended consequences of this policy to reduce migration and control borders. And what we see actually in the Caribbean region with countries that never had an independence, but look very similar to Suriname, like French Guiana, we don't see any spikes in migration from French Guiana to France. They're still part of uh, the, Fr they're still a French directorate, still part of France, and we've never seen spikes in migration from French Guiana to France, like we saw from Suriname to the Netherlands. So migration restrictions do not necessarily reduce migration, and that's for a few reasons. 
What they generally do is change the nature or the movement of that migration, and they mainly change the way in which people move. So even when we see that certain parts of Europe, for instance, have been closed off, we just see that people take different routes. When it became difficult to, to cross the small strait between Morocco and, and Spain, what we saw was people were leaving from Senegal in small boats. So it just changed the directionality of where people left from and where they tried to enter. It often does make, make journeys more precarious. It makes people um, try to enter under different statuses than they maybe would have really in the past. So I don't have that much time, so I wasn't going to throw that much data in here. But for instance, if we just show um, the GDP growth in the Netherlands over time, let's say the last 30 years, and you just lag migration by about two periods, they're almost exactly the same, showing that migration is really not driven by migration policies, but the underlying factors of what's going on in an economy that actually pulls or, pulls or does not pull labor migrants into the country. So these restrictions can really affect more migrant selection. We do see that. So for instance, um, the UK has made it much more difficult for even student migrants to enter the UK. And since students have a lot of other opportunities, like Maastricht University, for instance, um, they have chosen then not to go to the UK and has really um, been a problem for UK higher education. But you can see that it also shifts the type of migrants that might come to the country. So it doesn't change these underlying processes driving migration, like development, social transformation, and labor markets. And those are really the things that drive migration in the end. And if your migration policy isn't linked up to these broader social and economic changes, then migration policy actually won't really have much of an effect um, on what you'd like it to do. So there are many, many more common misconceptions about, about migration around the world and also within specific corridors. But we're out of time, so I will leave it there for the moment. And as I promised, um, even though we're almost out of time, I do want to open up the floor for just a couple of questions since there are a lot of you here and I want to give you that opportunity. So don't be shy. Does anyone have some questions? Yeah, I can hear you. It's just they're, they're taping it, so the um, recording won't hear you. Yeah, hi. Um, I would like to know if you can compare the uh, case of Suriname to um, the um, negotiations between the Turkey and the European Union, and if not, uh, why not? Thank you. Sure. So um, I would not directly compare the situation of Suriname to the, the current EU-Turkey deal. Um, first of all, the current EU-Turkey deal doesn't really, well, at this moment anyways, it doesn't allow for any mobility yet um, of, of Turks. Um, and it's also not a now or never situation um, in that regard. And really, the EU-Turkey deal is much more about stopping the flows of other migrants than of Turks. At the same time, I wouldn't necessarily use the Surinamese example, but I would absolutely say that the EU-Turkey deal has nothing, has done nothing but delay the inevitable, and that we, what we're already seeing is that migrants are just taking different routes. So now, because they're not coming through Turkey, they're coming through, um, they're coming more east into, into Europe. We are seeing, I think we're going to probably end up seeing more people coming through Russia in the future, and we've already seen a pickup in Libya. So you just see that migrants are going to start moving in, in different directions, and we see that it's become more precarious, more difficult, because the crossing from Libya is much, much more dangerous than the crossing um, from Turkey. Other questions? One or more clarifications from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. You're talking about numbers of migrants, and I couldn't tell if you were talking like per year or you were doing summations, you know, saying, oh, this is getting to be a high percentage of population, et cetera, because you had numbers like 196% in Monaco, and I just went, 
whoa, you know, you're... Yeah, so those are stocks. I should have made that clear. So that, those were stocks of migrants, not flows of migrants. So that was in a specific year, how many migrants in total were in that country. Yeah. The other kind of thing I'm wondering about is, is uh, like Saudi Arabia being so high mm -hmm. on your, the influx. Did your de definition of migrant take in the people that are like the fellows that come from Korea that are staying there to work for guest worker style and maybe going home in one year, two years, three years? They're not meant as, you know, becoming part of the society kind of thing, which is what most people think of as a migrant. You know, you're, oh, you're coming to the UK. You're going to stay in da 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 da. Yes, yeah, so the UN definition of a migrant is just anyone who stays in that country for at least one year documented. And th th so that's what it is. Yeah, but this is in a specific year also. So even when I showed those numbers of 80% of migrants, it still means 80% of the country's population is made up of migrants. They may be migrants that don't stay there their whole lives, but then others come and take their place usually. So someone might stay there for one, two, three years, leave, and the next one comes in. Because the demand for the labor hasn't changed. Many of these people are still working in oil fields. They're still doing the services um, that are needed in those countries. Yeah. Well, I'm, <laughs> I'm tempted to ask this question. Uh, looking at the US, Mm -hmm. and migration from Mexico, which is a big issue in the uh, presidential elections, and there's one candidate, as you know, who wants to deport 11 million illegal immigrants. Is that a fantasy? Is it at all possible? And how does this question or this statement will affect migration movement in this area? Is there any research done on this or any prediction based on previous data? Sure. So, um, first of all, it's completely unrealistic that this will happen, not only because it's very difficult to round up 11 million people and deport them, for one, um, but also just because it's unrealistic because the U.S. economy depends on these 11 million people so much. So it's not that these are 11 million people, you know, criminals in prisons, hanging out, doing nothing. These are people who are taking care of your children, who are cleaning your house, who are giving services, who are cutting your grass. Um, so. It, I think it will, the deportation will never happen. This is just strong language used to get a very specific constituency. Now, in how far it's going to affect migration flows, um, what's interesting to note is that basically ever since the financial crisis in the United States, there's been a negative net flow of Mexicans to the United States. So that means that more Mexicans are leaving the United States than entering the United States. Um, and uh, we know, so basically, this problem, quote unquote, the flow of it has already stopped, um, if you look at any of the data. So the, the highest numbers were reached in around 2006. And since 2007, numbers have been declining, um, both of documented and undocumented uh, Mexicans to the United States. Um, it, I don't think it's going to affect flows very much. I think it's, would def, it, if Trump were to be elected, um, I think it would highly affect relations with Mexico. But I don't think it's going to do very much to change the current ways in which flows happen because it's really so dependent on demand and on the economy. And I think something else that's interesting in the United States is that it also happens here in Europe. You get this kind of juxtaposition in what people think ideologically and then what they're willing to act on. So even so common people. So the majority of Americans in the United States would say, I don't have a problem with migrants. I have a problem with, well, they would say illegals, but we don't like to use that term. So undocumented or irregular migrants. Um, but then when you say, OK, but what about your housekeeper, Maria? What about her? And then they say, oh, she's different. So what people say in their ideology and what they do in practice, a huge part, portion of the people who are anti illegal migration are in some way currently employing them. So that's where you get all of this kind of strange um, policy making of this isn't allowed, but we're not really going to enforce situations. I mean, there needs to be a huge migration reform in the United States. OK, sure. One last question, and then we'll let everyone go. Do you have any data or know of data coming out that uh, as the rise in nationalism has occurred in country after country, it's occurred in the UK, Austria, 
America, USA. Mm -hmm. Any relationship in that rise to how things truly work out in the numbers, or, or do they keep the same myths going even if we have the rise in nationalism for reference migration? Yes, yeah, so in general, the numbers um, do not relate to rises in nationalism at all. Usually what relates to rises in nationalism is what's happening in the economy. Now, th that's more generally speaking, and that's absolutely... The other way around. The rise in nationalism is stopping people wanting to come. Uh, okay, so, no, so the rise of nationalism stopping people to come, we have not necessarily seen that in the past. Um, however, we do see that people make different choices of their destination depending on how welcoming they perceive the country to be. And some countries, at least previously, have, had, um, have, had, have been known more for being racist countries. But we're seeing now rises of nationalism in countries that did not previously have this um, idea attached to them. So like the United States, for instance, or the UK. And most people see, saw those countries as quite open um, and accepting of migrants. Whereas maybe a country like Denmark or Austria would have been considered racist or xenophobic by migrants. And a country like the Netherlands, migrants don't even know exists. So uh, there's not a, <laughs> in general. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. What, one, one more? Okay. <laughs> It'll be a short one, sorry. Um, I, I, um, so a lot of migration is obviously inevitable. Um, do you know of any um, models by countries that like are good like they have good policies where um, it doesn't become dangerous for people who want to go there um, I, I suppose a lot of countries maybe but I'd like to hear your opinion so sadly there actually aren't a lot of countries with good policies and that's often problematic a lot in the work that I do because developing countries often look to developed countries when they're making their policies in many different areas sadly including migration which is often problematic um, I would say one country that is quite a leader, that's mainly a receiving country, is Sweden. So Sweden has a lot of very good migration policies, both from a labor migration policy perspective and um, from a refugee perspective. Um, they really link their labor market, their, their um, labor migration to labor market needs one for one. So basically, if an employer can f find someone from outside of Sweden um, that fits their criteria, they just have to pay them the same amount and under the same conditions as a Swedish worker, and then they can come in immediately. And that's a very, very good way to actually make migration policy with regard to labor market policies. And for many, many years, they've been taking a large proportion of refugee resettlees. So actually putting their money where their mouth is and uh, really having a humanitarian stamp on what they're doing and caring about human rights. So okay, I really will leave it there now. Thank you for being here and for being here so late.